Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I'm a dental surgeon and also the course director for an online series of lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 15, Record Keeping. So the guidelines for record keeping are basically, it's supposed to be a record of the consent process. Despite the fact that consent can exist without any form, formal written record, it is suggested that a record, uh, written record be kept uh, it, just in case uh, it is required. Uh, it's also a record of the treatment which is provided for the patient in terms of uh, planning, execution, and also in terms of follow-up. And it's also a means of communication with the rest of the oral health team. As one of my previous colleagues or mentors had told me in the past, when working in a group practice setting, many times the notes that we do make are required by our colleagues when we are either not available or readily available, and just in terms of being able to communicate sort of what is going on or what the thinking is in, in our mind. By not articulating or recording it in some sort of a format, it doesn't do the patient any good, it doesn't do the team any good. So usually record keeping consists of four main parts. There's usually treatment planning notes, two surgical notes, three prosthodontic notes, and number four follow-up notes. So we'll start off with treatment planning notes. Basically, in terms of treatment planning notes, we would suggest that you write down what the chief complaint is of the patient. And normally they tell you in school that this is what the patient says in their own words. But the main point of knowing what the chief complaint is, is it reduces the risk of misunderstanding. In my own practice, I do a lot of implants, and I get a lot of referrals in from other colleagues sending patients in for implants. And the first question I always ask the patient is, why are you here? Uh, what is it that you'd like for me to do for you? And more importantly, what is it that you think that dental implants are going to provide for you? Many times you'll be surprised what patients think dental implants are going to do for them as compared to the reason why you think that they are there. Number two, you want to get a history of the present illness. And you want to write this down. So basically, how did the patient lose their teeth? Uh, and this is important in the sense that we always say that those that cannot remember the past or, or the history, those who cannot remember the history are condemned to sort of repeat the mistakes that were made in that history. So if it was the case that the patient lost their teeth because they grind their teeth or they have a heavy occlusion and you don't list this down, and you provide them with this beautiful implant solution without actually addressing this bruxism habit, you may find that this will become problems later. Uh, number two, what interventions have been attempted? So uh, my, one of my mentors in dental school, Dr. George Zarb, he said that if a patient comes in to see you for a set of dentures and they come in with a bag full of old dentures, you sort of need to ask yourself, okay, what is it that hasn't been addressed in these past interventions? So what interventions have been attempted and try to find out if there's something that you can do or write down what it is that you can do that can perhaps solve this patient's situation. Number three, why is the patient not happy with their current situation? Number four, what is it that they're seeking from implant therapy? I, I sort of went to this right at the chief complaint, but you know, in, in terms of the history of the present illness, relating it to the chief complaint, what is it that they are seeking from dental implant therapy? And number five, finally, what is the budget that patients are de dealing with? I'm a clinician. I'm not a. I'm not a banker, but at the same time, I mean, I, you know, I have empathy and I have compassion and, and care for my patients. However, at the same time, uh, patients need to be realistic with respect to what the cost elements are going to be for seeking some form of. Uh, implant therapy, not just in terms of the current cost, but also in terms of the long-term and maintenance costs that are associated with dental implants. Number three, you want to talk to patients about their desired outcome. So what is their desired end state? Number four, you want to deal with any significant issues that are pertinent to the patient and write this down. So for example, I've discussed uh, previously when we're talking about the consent process, uh, I talked about a patient of mine whose daughter was going to be getting married uh, two weeks after a procedure. And so you need to sort of get an idea from patients what sort of timeline you're dealing with 
what timeline they're dealing with, and things that may become a bit of an issue uh, in, in that time period. So things that are pertinent to the patient. Number five, you also want to record costs and ongoing maintenance requirements in terms of oral hygiene, mesostructures, and when we say mesostructures, we're talking about in, with, with removable prosthetics, things like the male and the female uh, zest anchor components in terms of uh, the abutments that may be required to be changed, uh, costs in terms of adjustments that are required down the road, uh, realistic outcomes with respect to the longevity of the prosthesis, and also in terms of uh, parafunctional habits, in terms of treating them and uh, long-term following up on them and making sure that they're not going to be a problem for the patient. So continuing along with treatment planning notes, you also want to make sure that your consent forms uh, are, are, are provided and recorded and try to be as detailed as possible, uh, that you also have some form of radiographs in terms of periapicals, panorex, and a cone beam CT. And for each of these uh, modalities or studies, uh, it would be, it'd be li listed uh, why these particular studies were ordered as compared to uh, other studies. And in terms of study models, so for more complex cases, uh, getting study models for the patient, getting a diagnostic wax op, some sort of a uh, orthotic appliance to sort of help you with the, uh, designing the patient's final prosthesis, any other forms of diagnostic aids that were required, and then detailed progress notes. Uh, number 10, any educational material handouts that were provided to the patient to provide them with information. And one thing that's also suggested is to ask patients questions from these materials and handouts to sort of try to ensure some understanding. And number 11, uh, documentation of ongoing clinical monitoring, uh, including uh, radiographs where appropriate. So in terms of the surgical notes, so usually in terms of the surgical note that I write for my patient, I usually like to write down the brand or type of dental implant uh, that was used. So we usually write down A, the location. So for example, in the residual lower right first molar area, B, the size of the implant. So uh, many times, so say a 5.0 millimeter platform implant by 13 millimeters in length. You usually want to type in or sorry, write in the type and brand uh, a brand and model of implant that you've actually used, uh, the lot number of the implant, which is usually provided, and it's also recommended that you list the expiration date uh, so as to make sure that there's good cross-referencing of the actual implant uh, that you've used. Continuing along with surgical notes, number two, you want to also list down any difficulties that were encountered during placement. So uh, in cases where you're placing immediate implants, if there was any fracture of the buccal plate, if there was any uh, bony voids, if there was any challenges in terms of uh, the, the patient themselves, like in terms of how they dealt with the surgical procedure, uh, difficulties that were encountered in terms of getting good initial fixation, not just in terms of torque value, but lateral stability. These, all these notes are going to be relied upon later in order to basically keep the process going along. Number three, talk about all the materials that were used. So in terms of not just the implants, but the type of irrigation or rinse that you were using, the types of sutures, the materials, any grafts, any uh, membranes that were used, any other adjuvant materials that were that were used during the procedure. Uh, you want to also list down the size and type of uh, abutment at uncovering. So if it's the case that you're doing a stage two procedure for this patient and taking off a cover screw, uh, you're either putting back a cover screw and a healing collar or a healing abutment, whether that be a two, three, four, six millimeter healing abutment. And remember that when we talked about healing abutments in one of the previous lectures, we said that there's different types of healing abutments. It's not just the height, but the actual width. So they do come in different widths as well. So try to articulate this information in your surgical notes as well. Number five, the OSI integration status using standardized measurements or descriptive criteria. Uh, generally, uh, from, from our perspective, you want to talk about things like reverse torque. Uh, you want to talk about uh, the, uh, the torque value that the healing abutments go in. And, but you also want to talk about things like lateral stability. So Austell is a company that makes a, uh, a tool. Basically, it's like a bit of a, a magnet and a glorified sort of like impression coping that they use to sort of assess what type of uh, healing from a lateral stability perspective there is. Uh, I've actually used this device uh, actually uh, in my own practice. You, know, you can actually uh, you can actually come up with your own sort of like uh, uh, subjective. Uh, digital uh, in implant stability quotient using your own fingers. Uh, so I would uh, definitely uh, recommend one 
when when try the appliance out. However, I wouldn't say that it's the is the gold standard with deter with determining uh, lateral stability for a patient. Uh, number six, any significant findings that may affect the expected outcome for the patient. And lastly, number seven, any recommendations or instructions or advice given to the patient about the surgical treatment. So I've included here a sample surgical note. So more or less in our practice, uh, we list down you know the medical history, the social history, extra intraoral exam has been uh, has taken place and we reviewed it that we've obtained consent from the patient, that the patient has the capacity, uh, that specific procedures have been discussed and they're referable to the clinicians, that uh, we've consented the patient in terms of disclosure, that we've described the procedures and the material risks, and we've answered specific questions. We've also tried to relate these to the patient's specific situation as per that modified objective rule that we talked about in the consent lecture uh, brought, brought on by Chief Justice Borolaskin back in the 1980s. And finally, we talk about consent in the form of costs that are discussed and explained to the patient, not just in terms of the current cost, but also long-term maintenance costs, that sort of stuff. And then finally, the patient was given some handouts and asked questions to confirm their understanding. From then, we talk about the anesthetic that we've uh, proceeded for for the patient. That being, in, in, in this case, uh, the patient was given two carpials of 1.8 milliliter lidocaine with epinephrine 1 to 100,000 and also one carpial of 0.5% marcaine, uh, which was given either preoperatively or intraoperatively. And sometimes I like giving patients marcaine postoperatively just from an analgesic perspective. Uh, then what type of uh, procedure was done. So in this case, we had a flap. We had atraumatic removal of tooth number 2-1, that the socket was curetted. Uh, the, the buccal plate, you notice there's no notes here on it, but the buccal plate was intact, uh, that we irrigated the site with saline and we achieved hemostasis for the patient. And then we place an implant with saline and cover screw into the 2-1 palatal bone. And as you can see, there's good 30 newton centimeters torque and good lateral stability. The implant that was used was an MIS-7 5.0 by 13 millimeter implant. We have the lot number listed along with the expiration date. A bone graft was placed into the gap jump junction. So we want to, want to talk about the quantity and the type of graft. So in this case, it was 0.25 cc's of direct gen mineralized cancellous cortical allograft, 250 milligrams to 1,000 uh, micrometer uh, mixed with the patient's own plasma. And this would be platelet poor plasma. There was a platelet rich, uh, fi uh, uh, -rich fibrin graft used here. A PRF membrane was placed on top with a 30 silk figure eight suture along with two 30 silk horizontal mattress sutures to support that platelet rich fibrin uh, membrane. Uh, one PA was taken intraoperatively, one Panerex was taken postoperatively. The patient postoperatively was given a prescription for amoxicillin. Postoperatively was also given over the counter ibuprofen. And post op instructions were given to the patient and her escort and follow up in seven days for suture removal. And follow up in four months for impressions and, of course, my signature. So, post surgical notes. So, in terms of post surgical notes, more or less, what we want to confirm from the patient is that healing has confirmed. So we like to list down that normal hearing has been confirmed, that swelling and bruising has been resolved, that sutures have been dissolved or removed, that there is the absence of pain, infection, or paresthesia, that the dental implant and or abutments are stable, that the transitional prosthesis is sustained comfortably, that radiographs confirm good dental implant position with stable peri-implant bone. So from a prosthetic perspective, what do we want to write down? So more or less, it's similar to the surgery notes. We want to talk about the size, location, the type, and the angulation of the dental implant. Number two, we want to talk about the osseointegration status using standardized measurement or descriptive criteria. I already talked about an implant stability quotient when we were discussing the surgical notes. You want to talk about number three, the size and type of abutment that was used. Number four, the type of prosthesis that's fabricated and the materials that were used. So continuing along with these prosthodontic notes, we want to talk about five, the type of connection. Is this a screw-retained prosthesis or is this going to be something which is cemented? Number six, we want to talk about a record of all the components that were secured for function in the patient's mouth. Uh, number seven, any pain or discomfort reported by the patient during the prosthodontic treatment, particularly at the time of delivery of the prosthesis. And finally, number eight, any recommendations, instructions, or advice given to the patient about the prosthodontic treatment. A sample stage 2 surgery note. So once again, in stage 2 surgery, basically, once again, reviewing the patient's medical history, social history, extraoral, intraoral exam, and review. Uh, we talk about 
a stage two surgery and an impression of, uh, in this case, upper left uh, first premolar. We take a periapical radiograph and we list that it's normal. Basically, we're confirming that there's no signs of no, no signs of bone loss, no signs of infection. That the, it appears that the implant has osseo integrated from a radiographic perspective. Uh, in terms of consent, we want to make sure we tell the patient what we're going to be doing here. In this particular case, we used one carpel of xylocaine, 2%, with epinephrine, 1 to 100,000. It was a local infiltration with an H incision to un uncover uh, the implant and reflection of the tissue. Uh, we removed the cover screw. We placed a transfer coping onto the tooth, uh, and we took one PA to ensure that it was uh, fitting. And then basically we took a fixture-level impression, and we sent it to the lab with the abutment analog, or fixture analog, and a UC. CLA abutment, and we placed a 5 millimeter healing abutment at 30 newton centimeters torque, and that post-operative instructions were given to the patient, and there's a, there's a signature from, from me. So a sample crown insert note, so in terms of when the patient comes in to get the crown, so we want to talk about 2-4 crown insert. Uh, patient has good contacts, that's what we've checked first. Uh, then we, we hit, once we seat the implant crown down, in this case it would be a screw retained crown. Even with a cemented one, you take a radiograph to ensure that the margins are good. Just like with a standard crown, you want to ensure that the margins of the abutment are seated on the implant face. Then we want to check the occlusion for the patient. And then in terms of a note, in terms of torquing the implant down, 30 newton centimeters, and in my case, I like using Teflon plugs and composite resin. Other people like using cotton pellets. Some people like using gutta perca. Some people use wax. Whatever to basically provide that little void so that should that screw access hole need to be accessed in the future, it can be. And then finally, patient given oral hygiene instruction and information on requirements for long-term care. And always set up a follow-up appointment for the patient. Uh, generally, for any of my implant patients, I will, after giving them the prosthesis, depending on how complex things are, at the bare bones minimum, I want to see my patients back for that particular implant at least in one year's time. Just to take a radiograph and to look at look at things and ensure that there's no bone loss, no evidence of peri-implant mucositis, that the oral hygiene is acceptable, and it, should there be any concerns that we can address these things at that point in time. So in terms of follow-up notes, more or less when I see my patients at that one-year mark, we usually take a radiograph of the patient. We also want to take a look and make sure that there's stability confirmed. I use, as I mentioned, my a digital between my fingers, implant stability quotient. And uh, you, like I said, you can sort of through some of your own scale, come up with your own numbers. So I always like to state that this digital ISQ is greater than at least 70, that, that there's an absence of pain for the patient, that the peri-implant soft tissues appear healthy, that the patient has an appointment for the prosthetic restoration, uh, that there's no voice complaints, and that the patient is attending recall appointments as scheduled, that the peri-implant soft tissues are healthy, that the oral hygiene of the patient is acceptable, uh, that the prosthesis is stable if it has been already provided, and that the occlusion is stable, and that radiographs confirm stable peri-implant bone and an intact prosthetic abutment connections. So the next lecture, ne lecture number 16, is about a literature review. And in this lecture, we're basically going to talk about some of the papers that we've highlighted, or you're going to see you know, it listed as my references. And we're just going to talk about how some of these were significant. So once again, I've listed all the references that we use in the production of this lecture series. And on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Catwoods Dental Implant Institute, I thank you for listening to our lecture.